NASCAR Radio, Channel 90. Ah, welcome back and joining us. Almost as if he's sitting right next to me, folks. That's the beauty of uh, voice protocol over an internet. He is uh, Auto Week's intrepid reporter, uh, Matt Weaver, who is all over the place, not only covering NASCAR, but also uh, near and dear to both Matt and my heart, the short track scene across America. Matt, we haven't talked since Christmas. Happy holidays to you and uh, and, and to yours. I, I want to jump into one of the columns that you recently wrote after NASCAR went to Music City to, and shifted their celebration uh, to there and, and, and celebrated their roots, so to speak. And lo and behold, uh, you had the opportunity to kind of circle the wagons a little bit and get some input on, um, you know, SMI and what they're trying to do. I guess now it's not called that. What is it, Sonic now or whatever? Uh, and, and and this overwhelming sense that folks within the NASCAR community really want to see the Nashville Fairgrounds come back into the NASCAR fold and take a place of prominence. Yeah, you know, I, I couldn't go to the championship banquet this year because that's Snowball Derby week, and that's right. You know, that that to me is up there with the Indy 500, the Daytona 500. So one of these days, I'm going to make it down to the banquet. Um, but I, I got a chance to circle back with some people. I read some of the the quote transcripts, and you know, I'm, I'm very close to uh, the, the new promotional group at Fairground Speedway Nashville, and I, I keep tabs with the people down at at Bristol and SMI. And there was just so much momentum. Um, I, I think the, the the banquet week was kind of a, a fork in the road moment. I think a lot of people treated Nashville in NASCAR circles like, yeah, it, w- it would be nice to maybe sort of kind of go back there next, you know, next decade or whatever. But if it doesn't happen, oh, well. And I think the banquet turned into a, a moment where it's like we need to go back. I think the the burnouts on Broadway brought you know, way more people than anyone expected. They got more media turnout locally, not just the mm-hmm. national beat writers, guys like Gus talking about it. They had local participation, the Tennessee newspaper, the local TV. And that's so important to making these races work because that's your advertising. And I think it kind of surprised the NASCAR industry. I mean, they're invested. They would like to, but they needed some sort of concrete evidence or, or proof that this could work, and I think they got it a couple of weeks ago, uh, championship week. You know, and on the other side of that conversation, well, let's remember the fair board and the political side of things. Uh, it, 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 was like, it was like, uh, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the freshman get to, da- get to know you dance, all right? They also, the city of Nashville and the board, got to witness up close and personal and firsthand the length and breadth and the, the, the depth of, uh, of NASCAR and its reach. Because I think one of the plans that fascinates me is making that whole fairgrounds area. We already know what they want to do with, uh, you know, Major League Soccer and everything else. And it kind of goes, in my opinion, hand in glove with, uh, you know, they, they call Atlanta the home of the New South. Well, I'm going to say the emergence of Nashville as, as a 21st century destination site as, as more and more comes up around it with professional, professional sports, et cetera. So both sides got to do a little bit of a kabuki dance, one with the other. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people kind of view Nashville as being, you know, the, the honky tonk kind of hokey yeah. music city. And that place has evolved so much. I mean, I'm only 31, so I, I don't have, the perspective that a lot of the guys who went to cover the old cup races in the 70s and 80s do. But I've gone to Nashville, to the fairgrounds, uh, for the better part of a decade and a half now, going to the All-American 400, um, attending and now covering late model races. And I've seen that city evolve firsthand. And, of course, I'm from the south. I'm from Mobile, so I'm only about five hours away. So I go through Nashville a fair bit. That place is way more than country music. That place is kind of the the cross section between you know it's old school country music past but also general pop culture and i think in some ways it's very synonymous to what nascar wants to be i think nascar within the last five years has started to really embrace its past while also trying not to sacrifice what it wants to be in the future i think it's one of those things where it's like uh, you said it on the show earlier you, you don't want to forget the past because 
that's going to help you to de- decide where you want to go in the future. And I think that Nashville can embody that so much. You can go to the fairgrounds. You can reference the history. Daryl Waltrip and Richard Petty and, and Dell Earnhardt. But that place and Sterling Marlin. <laughs> Sterling, absolutely. He's he's still doing it up there. I know. Amazing. So I, I think you can go back there and, and you can celebrate your future and your past, and that would be wonderful. You know, I, I have a lot of acquaintances that, uh, you know, it's probably been two decades since they visited Nashville. And I say it's not like that anymore. And I said, look, it's, it's, it's like Blake Sheldon and Gwen Stefani. All right. They're a couple now. And so it, it's not just cowboy hats and cowboy boots. And I think you articulated it very well. Um, you, you know, the, the, the other thing that I'd be interested because you never hold back, Matt, and that's why I like you so much. It's taken a while for, uh, for us to recover from, from some missteps that previous iterations of the leadership of NASCAR, and I'm going to leave it at that, uh, decided to pursue. And like turning the, the, you know, the USS, uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, you know, it, it, it's taken a little bit of time, but, but the new team that's in place, I think have, have, have displaced some of the pecking order of the constituencies and have placed fan, uh, involvement and fan entertainment paramount at the top of the list and then let the rest fall into place whether it is the rta drivers uh tv partners etc but that it has to go through that filter of how is it going to enhance the fan experience do you see it the same way i do and and you know this is kind of a complex question to answer so i'll say this i've been very hard on nascar in 2019 i think Anyone listening to the program knows that I'm not a big proponent of the the rules package that they tried out Mm -hmm. last year, and that's Mm -hmm. fine. What I want to give NASCAR a ton of credit for is that racing is trial and error, but mostly error. And I think one of my biggest frustrations with the sanctioning body in that previous administration was that when they made decisions, they were incapable in the public you know, in the public of being wrong. And I think this 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 current administration is very honest when they say, we're going to try some stuff. Maybe it's going to work, maybe it's not. But I think this is the bigger picture. There's a new car that's going to come out in, in 2021. There's a, a new TV broadcast rights negotiation that's going to have to take place in about five years. The 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 social media, the television, the the broadcast landscape is changing so much. So point being, there's a lot of things that are about to change in the overall sporting world, and NASCAR has to get this right. They have to get the car right. They have to get their broadcast, their their media partners lined up. They have to get everything right. And I think that if that means 2018, 2019, 2020, they're going to throw a lot of stuff up against the wall. We're just along for the ride. But I, I think that even in my most critical moments, I recognize that they're doing this in good faith. They're not doing this to be stubborn about anything. They don't think that they're all knowing. They're, they're getting feedback from the Race Team Alliance. They're getting feedback from um, the driver committees. They're getting feedback from us. Even when I write my critical columns, I know they're listening and there's always feedback. So I really appreciate what Steve Phelps and Steve O'Donnell and that crew, I promise you, I'm not trying to sound like a suck-up because I know I've been tough on them this year, but I know they all love NASCAR. They love stock car racing, and right now they're just, they have to get this right. So that means getting some things wrong now if they know they have the right formula 2021 and beyond. Look, look through my 50-plus years at this, uh, I, I have been in the crosshairs of NASCAR many, many times have worked for NASCAR, worked, you know, with Bill Jr. and Bill Sr. And and and, and to your point, uh, there was a period of time where if you got in the doghouse, you don't confuse the issue with the facts, all right? It, they, they were going to pound perception and make you accept it under duress to be reality. Uh, I think that there's, and I'm not saying it's total transparency because you can't have total transparency, you know, in an industry. But, and I love your line and I'm going to steal it from you. I promise you I'll quote it is that racing is not, a, is, is about right and wrong, but it's about being wrong more times than you're actually right. Because th- that is the key to it. 
And I'm not saying that everything they've done has been a home run. Some of them haven't even been a sacrifice fly. But I see a a, a, a rededication towards, as I say, you know, filtering it through and saying, well, if it didn't work, let's back up and let's try it again. Instead of convincing us that it was our fault that it didn't work. Do you follow me? Oh, absolutely. And I, I think um, it, it starts at the top. And it starts with, with Steve Phelps, who has been such a, a visible leader. Um, the, the one thing that immediately comes to mind, and this is more of a personal story, but I, I think fans will appreciate this one, is that the penultimate race of the season this year, Phoenix, I was walking from the infield over to the, the press box to watch the race from above, and I'm going through the tunnel, and I, I stop, a fan recognizes me, and I'm talking to him, and then... I see Steve Phelps walk by me. He's talking to a fan. And, you know, I, I catch up with him, and I'm waiting for the conversation to end. And it's a conversation with a fan. This is not a conversation mm-hmm. with another executive or um, a, a track rep or, or someone uh, who makes decisions for a living. This is a guy that has his feet on the ground talking to the people that matter, you listening to the show right now. And, you know, I, I, no disrespect to, to Brian France, but he wasn't that guy. And I think that the the drivers were very vocal about it, the media, the fans. They wanted to know that the leader, the guy who was steering the ship, was on the boat with them. And I see Steve there every single week, and he's talking to people, um, his constituency, like he like he's a political figure. Hmm. And he's got the people around him that are willing to try things. And I, again, I just I think the buck stops with Steve, and that's been a very powerful thing to watch in the past year and a half since he took over from Brent Dewar, who was also a really a good leader. He was active on social, always listening to fans. And I think the process started there when Brent took over as a NASCAR president. No, I, I could not agree more with you. And, and, and look, you and I both are not afraid to call them out. But, uh, you know, I, I think they set the doghouse aside nowadays and start saying, well, if you feel that way, tell us why. You know, tell me what you're thinking. And uh, that that's a refreshment. I don't want people to always agree with me because that would be a terrible way to live. But if you want to engage in dialogue, I'm all for it. Matt Weaver is our guest. I say Go it ahead. all the time. that when, when was any great decision going through history, not just sports, but just the history of the world, when was any great decision made in a vacuum? It was typically made with some sort of collaboration, with some sort of uh, communion, and that's where we are now. And trial and error. It's all part of it. Matt Weaver, as I said, is our guest from Auto Week. Good friend, a a, a, a guy that gets it. And I'm going to f- completely endorse uh, this this side of the thing. It's not just about NASCAR. It's not just about the elite uh, three tiers of NASCAR. It, it, it's about the backbone, too, for him. And that's, uh, that, that's the, the world of short track racing. Which leads me to a question. And we haven't spent a lot of time on this, Matt. We, we've been given an indication is now that, you know, that ARCA has, for all intents and purposes, merged and acquired, you know, K&N East, K&N West, everything, yada, 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 all under the ARCA banner. Um, have you gotten some input as to how this is all going to shake out? Not in 2019, because that's going to be a formative stage, but in 2020 and beyond, where this is going to fit in the entire NASCAR uh, uh, motorsports, uh, uh, shall I say, uh, motorsports industry? I don't want to give too much reporting on this, just because I think a lot of the feedback I've heard is very critical. Mm-hmm. And I think and it should that be. You- and yeah, it should well, be. I, I, I think you know this to be true. Anytime that you have really big change, you know, people get used to a certain comfort zone. And NASCAR is trying to figure out a way to to merge two different rule books, um, mm-hmm. a, t- a type of car that uses two different engines, the Ilmore and and the the Yates engine, and trying to placate those who have been running ARCA and placate those who have been running K&N. And in the process, you're not going to make anyone 100% happy. You're just trying to find a medium. But this is the message that I think I would want to deliver. Um, and I, I think you'll this will resonate with you, too. I think one of the larger mistakes NASCAR has made in the last 30 years is creating a kind of baseball a double A triple A major league scale hey, to their to their sanctioning. Amen. 
Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, you go back to Bush North, you had the guys who ran that series. Now they're running ACT or they're running past late models. Um, the Southwest Tour, uh, you had a lot of veterans. Um, you know, Herschel, Herschel was, was with the guy there. Um, you had the veterans. Now they're running late models. I think that the fact that you have so many of these veteran teams, you know, when I first started covering ARCA, I really loved ARCA because it was kind of the, the intersection between youngsters like Myatt Snyder, Harrison Burton going toe to toe with Frank Kimmel and, and Tommy Hessert and Josh yeah. Williams. And I think that in the last five years, it's all teenagers. Everyone in yeah. ARCA, everyone in KNN is 15, 16, 17. The and that's court. not sustainable. Yeah. Yeah, the kitty corkers, they're gonna they're gonna move on. All right. And and it's and and the tragedy is uh they're all not gonna move up. They're gonna move on. There's a big mm-hmm. difference. Okay. And if you're NASCAR, now, you want them to move on to something that's within your uh, your up. wheelhouse yes. in NASCAR, yep. not going on to late models. Exactly. Matt, I could go on for hours with you. Uh, it, it, it really is a distinct pleasure. We need to do this more often, but in order to do it more often, i got to need to get more assignments. So you understand that Catch-22 very, very well. Wish you a very happy New Year and uh, looking forward to your continued coverage. And it's just it's nice to know that you don't have to camp out in the parking lot of the Home Depots anymore. <laughs> no, I'm moving on up, right? That's right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, he's at Lowe's. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Matt, thanks so much. Have a great weekend, okay? Hey, thanks, guys. All right. Uh, He's a guy that really um, doesn't pull his punches, doesn't criticize just for criticism's sake, but uh, has, at the very best interest, trying to make sense of all this craziness. We will continue at 866-PIT-LANE, 866-748-5263, and on the social media at Jack on Sports and at SiriusXM NASCAR next. I'm free. I'm free. Free Speech Friday. Well, I have a microphone and you don't. So you...